have the pleasure to introduce our professor, our uh, speakers, <laughs> uh, Rob de Passwell. Uh, we are honored to uh, begin this lecture series with Dr. Uh, Rob de Passwell, who is the distinguished professor of Buddhist studies in the UCLA Department of Asian Languages and Cultures, that the Irvings and Jean's strong chairs in humanities at U uh, UCLA and founding directors of the University Center for Buddhist Study and Center for Korean Studies. Just like Dr. Leon Hurwitz, uh, Dr. Baswell is also well versed in a number of East Asian languages. Dr. Baswell completed a BA in Chinese in uh, 1971. Uh, this is 40 years ago. <laughs> 40 years ago, let me, yeah. And the MA, MA in Sanskrit in, nine, uh, in 1981, and a PhD in Buddhist studies in, uh, only, I don't know how you made this, only two years later, so you got your PhD, right? I'm able, a PhD, right? Uh, this is a miracle for me. Uh, all from the University of California, uh, Berkeley, uh, before returning to, uh, 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 to the academic world, uh, Professor Baswell spent uh, seven years uh, as an ordained Buddhist monk in Thailand, Hong Kong, and Korea. Dr. Uh, Baswell was elected president of the Association for Asian Studies in 2008. The first specialist in either Korean or Buddhist study to hold the very, very distinguished honorable position. In 2009, uh, he was awarded the prestigious uh, Manhattan Grand uh, uh, Prize in Korea in recognition of his pioneer's <coughs> contributions to establishing Korean Buddhist studies in the West. He was elected to American Academies of Art and science in 2016. Uh, also, like uh, uh, Dr. Dion Harvitz, uh, Professor Baswell is extremely, extremely uh, pr uh, prolific, uh, so productive. Uh, he is widely considered to be the uh, premier uh, Western scholars on Korean Buddhism and one of the top specialists on the East Asian uh, Chang, Jing, or, or, or Wong uh, Song traditions. He has published 16 books and some 40 articles on various aspects of the Korean, Chinese, and Indian, Indian, very special <laughs> Indian uh, traditions of Buddhism. This also reminds us of Nilyong Herbis. And uh, uh, because uh, probably many of you know, don't know that uh, Robert also published an article on uh, Indian, uh, Indian Buddhism. Uh, as well as, as on Korean religions more uh, broadly, Professor Baswell served as editor-in-chief of the two volume uh, encyclopedias Encyclop uh, Encyclop of Buddhism and co-authors uh, with Don uh, Lopez of the 1.2 million word uh, Princeton Dictionary of Buddhism. This is now across the country, the most, most, most uh, standards, uh, authorities, uh, a, a reference book for the any Buddhist uh, traditions. So, uh, as you can see, uh, Professor Baswell make an ideal uh, scholar to keep up this uh, distinguished lecture series in honor of uh, Dr. Neon Hurwitz, because he's truly uh, boundary breakers, uh, he's crossed different disciplines, different traditions of Buddhism, uh, Korean, Chinese, uh, Indian. Uh, he knows non boundaries between different uh, Buddhist traditions. And he's also a network builder. Uh, so thanks to him, many of us come together uh, to work on some projects. And uh, so um, I think that this, he is just very, very, and he has been my idol. Since I was a graduate student at McMaster, uh, under the three of his friends, <laughs> Koichi Shinohana, uh, Felix Granov, and Bob Schaff. And I have always, always been uh, amazed by how broadly uh, he, and deeply that he, work, he, was, he is able to work on uh, Buddhism, different aspects of Buddhism. And, but 
of course, I find it's impossible to emulate, not only in his uh, erudition's passion for scholarship. One thing is that about the ways that he's maintained his youth. <laughs> 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 because I think the first time I saw you is probably almost 20 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. When I was uh, in a conference that organized by uh, one of my best friends, uh, James, James, James Ben, who is also uh, is one of his former uh, students. Mm -hmm. Uh, but since then, uh, every time I read with uh, Roberts, I just find that he, even <laughs> he almost the same, <laughs> like a change. So this is something that we can, I feel that I cannot emulate here. Yeah. But <laughs> uh, that, uh, I'm very, very grateful to him uh, and that he agreed to come here to uh, initiate this uh, special lecture series uh, for uh, some ones that uh, I have uh, admired for such a long time, and I also feel that this is a really, really wonderful karma that uh, I such as, uh, gr uh, wonderful Western scholars on Buddhist study come here to keep up this is uh, special lectures in honor of another uh, very uh, important uh, Western scholars on Buddhism uh, through this lecture series founded by a Chinese Buddhist temple, uh, named out of the six pages, Huimen. <laughs> <laughs> so this is something that maybe can only happen in Vancouver, <laughs> because a city that's believed to be uh, closest to East Asia, both geographically and culturally. Now, I'm not going to uh, delete your uh, pictures of hearing from Professor <laughs> Robert Baswell. Yes, please, Robert. <laughs> I want to try to look at something in Korean Buddhism, in both Korean and Chinese Buddhism, in fact, and kind of trace back some of his antecedents in earlier Indian materials and Indian meditative literature uh, by looking at this issue of doubt in East Asian Zen practice and where we might find some of the, um, some of the resonances of this in, uh, in India as well. So I'm going to, like Professor Hurwitz would, would do, kind of move back and forth between both Chinese and Korean materials. I'll make a couple mentions of Japanese, but mostly focus on Chinese and Korean, but then go back into earlier Sanskrit and Pali sources as well that give us some, some uh, interesting uh, contrasts and resonances with what eventually takes place within the Zen tradition in East Asia. So as I talk about this, um, I'm going to be using the term Chan, Sun, Zen. I'll probably use them with with no rhyme or reason at all. Sometimes I'm talking about the Zen tradition more broadly. Uh, sometimes I'm looking at Chinese Chan tradition in specific. Other times we're looking at the Korean Sun tradition. They really are a single tradition, though, with, with, with certain national uh, specific characteristics, but a, one, one single tradition of Zen. So if I use Chan or Sun or Zen, I'm really talking about the same thing all the way through. So please don't get confused uh, as I go through this there. But I think one of the um, most striking transformation that's, uh, transformations that occurs in Buddhism as it adapts to Korea and especially to East Asian culture more broadly was this creation of new forms of meditation that don't really have any analogs in the imported Indian traditions of the religion. Here in the West, um, I think the tradition of meditation that has gotten the most, probably the lion's share of attention, is the tradition of, of uh, Zen, which is called Chan in Chinese, Sun in Korean. These, um, uh, this all comes from the fact that the, the school itself adopted the term Chan, which is a transcription of probably a Middle Indic form of the Sanskrit word dhyana, probably chana, something like this. Uh, which uh, is the name for its school. So it, it, um, it, it tried to think that it had pride of place in talking about meditative expertise in East Asian Buddhism, that it was the repository of contemplative um, expertise in East Asian religion as well. If you look at Zen text, they uh, just revel in these exuberantly told tales about meditation and contemplation and how these are played out in practice in the interactions especially between the enlightened Zen masters and their typically benighted students um, and how these interactions could actually serve to catalyze an authentic awakening experience. So I thought I would start just to give us a feel and a flavor of the tradition with uh, three sort of representative stories that um, uh, will give us a sense of how this tradition works. 
This is an exchange between a very famous Zen master in China, Chan master, named uh, Ma, Ma Zhu Daoyi in the 8th century, and one of his students named uh, uh, Hong Zhou Shui Liao. And um, Shui Liao comes to the teacher, Ma Zhu, and asks him this question, what is the meaning of Bodhidharmas coming from the West? This is a very common Zen test question. Uh, it's used by masters to test their students, and it's used by students to sort of see what the master has to say. What this really means is Bodhidharma is the putative founder of the Zen tradition who brings the Zen tradition from, from India to East Asia. So when we ask what's the meaning of Bodhidharma coming from the West, it's really asking what is the meaning of Zen? In a sense, almost what is the meaning of Buddhism and the Buddhist religion more broadly? So Mazu says, well, come a little closer and I'll tell you. So Sri Dya was quite close. Madzu kicks him in the chest, knocked him to the ground. In a daze, uh, Sri Dya gets up, claps his hand, and starts laughing loudly. So Madzu asks, so what's making you laugh now? Sri Dya said, well, hundreds of thousands of Dharma gates and teachings of Buddhism and immeasurable sublime meetings are in the tip of a single hair. Today I have completely understood their source. So there's one. Getting kicked to the ground, and that's enough to somehow catalyze his enlightenment. Then we have this very famous exchange uh, that is uh, the very first, uh, uh, first exchange we find in a collection of the Zen sayings called the, uh, uh, the Gateless uh, uh, Checkpoint or the Checkpoints of the Master named Gateless, uh, uh, Wuman. This is um, an exchange between a student who comes to the Master, uh, Jiao Zhou Tongchan, and asks him, does a dog have the Buddha nature or not? Jiao Zhou answers, doesn't have it. Wu, Wu. I think this is a verb. We often see this translated as just no, but really it's a verb. He doesn't, doesn't have it. This is the wrong answer. So we'll see how this works out as we go along. And finally, this is uh, from a contemporary like, Korean uh, teacher who's now the current uh, Jung, uh, 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 head of the Choge order in Korea, a man named uh, Jin Jinje Pabwon. So he uh, was working on this Hwadu, which I'll be talking about in a bit. These are sort of Zen meditative contemplative topics. Uh, a, 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 a shang yin hanging from a tree. This is, a, this is from an earlier story about a, a Zen teacher named, named, named shang yin uh, who sort of has this test for his students. Suppose uh, you're hanging by your teeth from a tree and somebody comes to you and asks you, what is, what's the meaning of bodhidharmas coming from the West? He says, well, if you answer him, you fall to your death. If you don't answer him, you're being rude to the questioner. So what's, what, do you, what do you tell him? What do you do? So he's working on this, this topic. Uh, and he says, for two years and five months, I forgot about the distinction between retreat seasons, free season, heje, kelche. Never went outside the monastery gate. As the days and months passed, I continued to wrestle with this, with this topic. One morning at 3 a.m., which is when monks first get up in the morning, I was making my way to the main Buddha hall for the morning service. In the pre-dawn darkness, I tripped over a rock. As I picked myself up off the ground, this Hwadu suddenly shattered to pieces. He has an awakening experience. Okay. So, what to make of this? These kind of um, exchanges uh, are called in the tradition um, uh, Gongan, or as I'll talk about in just a bit, Hwato, or Hwadu. These are, um, uh, actually this is a term that comes out of Chinese law, in fact. A, a gongan is literally the magistrate's table. Uh, back in the old days in China, medieval China, there wasn't a separate judge. Uh, there, were, there, were, there were magistrates who moved from locale to locale with their table. They would arrive in the village. Uh, if there was any sort of problems in the village that needed to be resolved, he would sort of sit behind his table. People would come before him, present a case, and he would resolve the case right then and there on the spot. So kind of, a, kind of like a judge almost. So these, these gongan, this term gongan, is actually means something like a, like a case in law. And I think actually in the Zen tradition, maybe the idea of a precedent is a good way to think about this. These are precedents that sort of tell us um, what the experience of enlightenment is like in a quite distinctive way, though. So when I, uh, and eventually it's sort of interesting too, this, uh, this term gongan as a, as a case or a precedent in law comes to refer also to a genre of Chinese literature which are kind of detective stories, you know, um, when you kind of figure out what's going on and, and decide a case or break a case as it were. So these are used in the Zen tradition to kind of describe what these, <coughs> these exchanges are like. Here's the, here's the, uh, the term here, gongan for koan. 
So at first glance, you know, when you hear one of these stories or read one of these stories, they appear almost intractable, even sometimes I think almost nonsensical. You know, how is it that being kicked to, to the ground by your teacher or hearing about a dog having a Buddha nature or not or tripping over a rock, how is this going to somehow generate enlightenment? How would a teacher use these kinds of stories and sayings to instruct their students and test the, the depth of their understanding? When you look at Indian Buddhist texts, we have some very detailed descriptions and accounts of the content and quality of the Enlightenment experience. We have various stages of the path that are quite rigorously laid out in very great detail with, with, much, with much specific information of what actually happens at that particular stage of the path. The Darshana Marga, for example, the path of vision. When you first see the reality of Nirvana as something so compelling that it completely overwhelms and overcomes all of your speculative views about what the world is. You know what the world actually is at that point. Um, the path of cultivation, what you cultivate after that initial vision and so forth, the extinction of the contaminants, the asavakchaya. <coughs> All these are, are very specific uh, meditative concepts in the Indian tradition which have quite specific content. We don't have anything nearly like this in the Zen tradition in East Asia. So what process can be involved here? <coughs> so what I'm going to do to try to explain this a little bit is to focus on a specific kind of practice that draws on these, these gongan, these precedents, uh, these cases, really the lore of the lineage almost within Buddhism as grist for the mill of meditation. And um, these are called in this context huadu, um, uh, a topic, a topic of meditation. Um, and it, the practice is called um, uh, the, the kan, to observe or to examine the, the hua, here the, the hua means a huato or, 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 or a huadu, and um, san then would be the, the, the zen of this. So the zen of uh, kind of examining these meditative questions. These are taking these precedents not as sort of um, <coughs> material for literary exegesis, as was commonly done actually in the Zen tradition in China and later on in Japan, but instead as topics of meditation practice. So when we talk about using these gongans in meditation, we're talking about kanwa, kanwa chan, in fact. I've struggled for years as to how to translate this term. Um, I finally come around to using a more freer rendering now, something maybe like questioning meditation. Because in kanwa san, what these precedents are, are used for is you, you use this lore of the lineage um, not as sort of repositories of pedagogical lore or literary exegesis, but instead because they express the enlightened state of mind of the Zen master who was involved in the exchange. So the students then are, are taught to use these, as these cases or these precedents as topics of inquiry, a huadu or a huato. Sometimes we see this translated as critical phrase or keyword in the tradition because if you think back to that, 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 that full exchange uh, with Jiaojo, does a dog have Buddha nature or not? Jiaojo answers, Wu, no, it doesn't have it. Um, you could say that the, the, the way that you would com contemplate that particular exchange then would be to focus on what's critical, the, the critical topic in that, in that exchange, which is this word no then. So sometimes you see it translated as keyword or critical phrase, but I think more generally, maybe question, questioning meditation might work. And so enlightenment, or the experience of Buddhahood in this tradition then, is then achieved by simply seeing, or recognizing, or maybe better even re recognizing the fundamental nature of the human mind. The notion here harkens back to accounts that we find even in foundational Indian Buddhist texts like the Pali and Nikaya. Nikaya. This is a line from the Pali text um, that says, the mind, O monks, is luminous, but sullied by adventitious defilements that come from without. This papasuramidam uh, bhikavechitam. Zen texts also have a similar kind of des description about the nature of the mind uh, and use the term numinous awareness for this. They equate this with the quality of sentience that's common to all sentient beings, of which we as human beings and really all living creatures, in fact, are. This idea of sentience is something that kind of shines over the sense spheres, illuminating them, allowing them to be cognized through the six sense faculties. And this is not just a figurative usage at all. Uh, the idea is that the mind is like this bright source of light which is constantly shining out through all the senses, our eye, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, allowing us to experience the world and all of its diversity through all of the senses. 
And if it weren't for this, we would be completely unaware, insentient beings, insentient to the world around us. So we have this very famous uh, Chan monk, uh, Linji Yixuan, says, you meditators right now are vividly illumining all the things and taking the measure of the world. You're the ones who give the names to the things of these three realms of existence. And so as meditation practice kind of builds and enhances this inherent radiance of the mind and restores and strengthens that, that quality of mind, this brightness becomes so intense that it almost, in a sense, kind of shines through objects, exposing their inherent emptiness. It's kind of like, I tell my students sometimes, it's sort of like you think of a, we look at our hand, it looks very solid, like a solid thing, but you put your hand in front of a bright searchlight and you'll see the bones and tendons in your hand, you see the blood flowing through your hand and see there's something uh, quite different than what we normally experience then. So this numinous awareness, uh, which is just sentience, uh, is the quality that's most fundamental to all sentient beings. It's the faculty that constitutes the potential for enlightenment, but it's also the quality of mind that is perfected through meditative introspection. And by single-minded attention to the Hwadu, this would create this sort of introspective focus that eventually would lead the student back to this enlightened source of the mind. This is what is called tracing back the radiance. This is the technical term for this process in the Chan tradition. Tracing back the radiance that's emanating from the mind back to its source. This is a kind of meditation in its own right, but it also is sort of a technical term for this process of introspection that is developed during all kinds of meditation. So we have a um, Korean um, commentator from the Choson dynasty, a man named Yuil, who describes this, I think, quite, quite compellingly. He says, tracing back the radiance um, of one's own mind is like seeing the radiance of the sun's rays and following that, following that radiance back until you see the orb of the sun itself. So you would see a ray of light coming out. You trace that ray back to the source and you see the sun in the same way that you, if you trace your sentience back to its source, you would see the mind itself then. <coughs> So once students have recovered or rediscovered this source of their own minds through this kind of tracing back the radiance process, they would, num they would come to know at that point what the enlightened intent of the Zen master was who was involved in this case, this precedent in the tradition, and in turn would then consummate in themselves the same state of enlightenment. So as they would contemplate the sayings and doings of the lore of the lineage of Chan, the students are kind of patterning their minds after the minds of the eminent Zen masters of old until ultimately they think and act as one. This is what the tradition calls the mind seal or mind stamp. Uh, it's something like, um, um, probably our generation would know, the old good housekeeping seal of approval for something. This is the Zen master's seal of approval uh, that you understand what's going on in, this, in tradition. Um, in the course of this practice, the student is essentially kind of emulating the mind of the master so that the mind of the patriarch is, as it were, kind of stamped or seals the mind of the student. And this brings about then the transmission of mind that's so central to Chan or Sun lore. I think also uh, when we hear about Kanma, Kanma Chan, the, this is the closest parallel we have is in the Japanese tradition, uh, the koan practice that's commonly done in the Linzai, but it also has been done in the Soto tradition uh, traditionally as well. We often think this is a search for the answer to the Gongan. This is how the Japanese would do this. They actually have, uh, have books that give answers to these different cases that are used in the Zen tradition. And students were supposed to be able to come up with the appropriate answer for each specific Gongan. Koreans and Chinese uh, do not do it this way at all. Uh, you're not looking for an answer. You're looking to recreate in your mind the same state of mind the master had when he gave his response or was involved in this interaction. And once you have patterned your mind after the master in that exchange, essentially you can give your own answer, which could be quite different than the answer the master himself had given in the Gongan. So there isn't any one answer to the Gongan or to these exchanges. There are multiple answers that are possible because all of them come from the same enlightened source. And we know this because even Zhao Zhou himself, when he was asked, does a dog have Buddha nature or not, uh, other times he answered yes to the same question, not just no. When we look at the Kan Chan, though, what's most crucial to this tradition is the place of, place of doubt. 
Um, uh, this is the most critical dimension of Kanma san, where you have to have this kind of questioning or inquiry into this topic. This is a technical term in Buddhism uh, and uh, comes to be adopted in the Chan tradition, uh, to, who, which views this as the motive force that propels this meditation forward. We have this notion of doubt in Indian literature, but it's used also in a meditative context, but in a, in a quite different context, almost exactly the opposite. Rather than being the motive force behind practice, doubt is actually treated almost exclusively as a hindrance to concentration, that is so-called nivarana, to meditation practice and to meditative absorption. And so doubt doesn't have any kind of constructive role to play in Indian Buddhist spiritual culture, but was uh, an obstacle that the student was compelled to overcome in the course of practice. But by the time we see this concept of doubt uh, fully apprised and considered in East Asian uh, Buddhism by Zen adepts in particular, what was originally a debilitating mental concomitant to the Indians has been transformed into the principal force that drives one forward towards enlightenment. So how does this happen? If we look at um, some of the earliest treatments of doubt in Indian materials, uh, it's most often considered to be the fifth of a set of five hindrances, these so-called nivarana, to mental absorption, these very deep levels of meditative concentration, along with uh, sense desire, ill will, sloth and torpor, meaning just basically tiredness, uh, restlessness and worry, and finally we see our term doubt, this vichikitsa here. Um, doubt doesn't have an affective dimension in material, in any materials, but it's viewed primarily as a debilitation of the intellect. And so we see in the case of uh, Buddha Gosa in his Vasudhi Magga, the path of purification, he says doubt has the characteristic of uncertainty. Its function is to vacillate or waver. It's manifested as indecisiveness or by taking various sides. The proximate cause of doubt is said to be unsystematic attention. This is a technical term I'll be talking about in a bit, which should be regarded as an, uh, as an, an obstacle to spiritual cultivation, to patti patti actually here. So what doubt is, is a skepticism about, about various intellectual propositions concerning the state of one's existence in past, present, and future. You know, did I exist in the past or not? Uh, what and how did I exist in the past? Uh, having been something before, how did I become something else in diff different points in the past? And so you have these sort of really almost kind of existential questions about the nature of existence. And this applies in both past, present, and then in future. But because of the uncertainty created by doubt, the mind therefore becomes agitated. And this obstructs the quality of sustained thought, the ability to, to focus on, the, on, a, on an issue and continues to stay focused on that issue over time, kind of the inception of concentration almost. And because of this, it therefore hinders full meditative absorption. But this doubt won't be fully removed from our minds until all kinds of wrong views, these mitya drishti, are resolved in the experience of awakening at the point of the path of vision uh, manifesting itself. And this is the point at which one becomes a stream enterer, where you first enter the path leading to, uh, to enlightenment directly. At that point, you have this direct insight into the reality of nirvana, and this forever vanquishes um, all of the uh, kind of speculative or subjective views you have about the nature of oneself or of one's world. So all doubts completely vanish. So doubt is something that you have to overcome and get rid of in Indian Buddhism, rather than being something that's a useful tool for practice. I think what's important to note, though, for our continuing discussion tonight, is that doubt was always viewed by Indian Buddhists in association with sustained meditative practice. It has a meditative dimension, but a dimension that has to be overcome rather than developed. And this is because it's one of these five hindrances that obstruct various of the, of the constituents of full meditative concentration or dhyana. So we have doubt actually being obstructive to sustained thought, as I mentioned before, but the other hindrances also uh, hinder one or another of these five um, so-called dhyananga, uh, the, the aspects of dhyana, from one-pointedness of mind to rapture, to applied thought to ease, and so forth. So it's only as you remove these five hindrances, including doubt then, that the meditator is able to 
develop all the factors that will that will sustain uh, full-blown meditative absorption, dhyana or jhana. Again, dhyana is the term chan in transcription and step. And this is where you first enter the, the first stage of jhana, when all five of these constituents are present, all five of the hindrances are gone. The Indian Buddhists teach various kinds of counteragents uh, to overcome these hindrances. And in, uh, in the case of doubt, for example, uh, probably the most fundamental way that they talk about counteracting doubt is, um, is in uh, the Satipatthana Sutta, the Foundations of Mindfulness Sutra, where the meditator is simply taught to note mindfully the presence or the absence of this hindrance. Uh, so the Buddha says, uh, here in O monks, when doubt is present, the monk knows there is doubt in me. When doubt is absent, he knows there is no doubt in me. He knows the uh, arising of non-arisen doubt. He knows the uh, he knows the non-arising in the future of the rejected doubt and so forth. So he's just aware. Is doubt present or is doubt not present? And this uh, is kind of a very uh, simple sort of psychological exercise in a sense. Meaning if you are aware that doubt is present, awareness is then dominant, doubt is not. So if you're aware that doubt is present, awareness now dominates and doubt vanishes. It's a very simple process, actually, of counterbalancing the mind then. But um, the proximate cause that I mentioned before of doubt is this unsystematic attention, this ayonisho manasakara. Um, and the Buddhists teach very specific kinds of practices and contemplations that can be uh, thought that are thought to be conducive to abandoning doubt. These include especially the systematic attention to the dichotomies, the distinctions between what is skillful and what is not skillful for oneself or others, what is noble or vile, what is good and evil, these kind of dichotomies uh, uh, about our experience, so that the meditators would learn how to train their minds in skillful doctrinal knowledge, meaning wisdom. And um, by developing wisdom and by mastering the scriptures and the content of the scriptures, one would develop this wisdom into a spiritual faculty that would help to control doubt. We see, for example, in um, uh, one of Kumarajiva's um, uh, early texts, this is a, a, one of the Kuchian translators that Leon Hurwitz worked on, actually, a text called the, the Zhuochan Zhou Sanmei Jing, the, uh, the book on city meditation, which compiles a number of teachings on dhyana practice from mainstream teachers in the Savastavada tradition uh, in Central Asia at this time. And there, uh, doubt is um, uh, said to be a product of delusion, which is to be overcome through one or another of the so-called inhibitory or counteractive meditations, in this case, the meditation on dependent origination. So by realizing that things are a product of cause and conditions leading to an effect, one will overcome one's doubts about the reality of this world then. And so we see doubt always um, appearing in direct distinction to the more intellectual faculty of faith, not to the affective faculty, um, I'm sorry, of wisdom, not the affective faculty of faith. So faith, you know, the Indians love their list. Um, one of uh, Leon Hurwitz's contemporaries, Richard Robinson at the time, said Buddhists in India have a so-called cancer of the categories. They like to categorize everything. And here we have another list of five, uh, the five spiritual faculties uh, from diligence down, uh, faith and diligence down through wisdom, uh, where the faculty of faith is actually countering not um, doubt, but actually ill will, showing that it has this affective dimension instead. So faith produces uh, mental ease or bliss, what is called priti in the tradition, which brings about serenity of mind and thought. And faith produces self-confidence, uh, engendering this conative characteristic of diligence instead then. So faith and wisdom, which were at equal poles from this faculty of mindfulness. If you go back here, we see faith, diligence, mindfulness, concentration, wisdom. These are balanced by mindfulness. This, if you have too much faith, um, uh, wisdom will not grow. You have too much diligence, concentration will not grow. So you have to keep them balanced with mindfulness always then. So <clears throat> by balancing faith and wisdom then, um, faith will ensure that there will not be excessive questioning, wisdom in a sense, which could lead then to a constant kind of skepticism about things, always questioning rather than simply accepting some things tacitly. Wisdom will guard against excessive faith, which could lead to kind of a blind, uncritical acceptance instead. 
<coughs> so the result was a kind of rational faith, a poly term, you know, the poly term for this, that was prompted more by investigation, wisdom, rather than by acquiescence, faith. The examination of Buddhist teachings would encourage the student to take up religious practice, and after cultivating those teachings, the tacit faith one has would be confirmed through direct experience then. So this testifies to the fact that faith has kind of a subordinate place to play in Indian Buddhist practice. Faith may be a basis for practice, but it always had to be carefully counterbalanced by correct intellectual understanding, systematic attention, the Buddhists would call this. <coughs> we see a rather different interpretation of both faith and of doubt appearing in, uh, in Zen practice as it goes on. And this is uh, what the Zen Buddhists call the notion of I Ching, or I, uh, the uh, sensation of doubt. Um, this is specifically how doubt is described in the context of the Kanwa Chan tradition. Um, Qing, as I, so far as I know, never really glossed in the tradition, but, it, uh, but it's, its connotations are quite clear, I think. Qing is sort of this palpable sensation that ultimately serves to pervade all of one's thoughts, feelings, and even one's physical body eventually with this doubt, doubt that's generated by this questioning meditation that's done. And so I think it's, it's quite a fascinating thing to, to watch how this conception of doubt changes as this Kanwa Chan technique develops. When we um, look at some of the early discussions about the place of doubt in Zen meditation, some of these hone, I think, fairly closely to what we've seen already in the context of Indian Buddhism as doubt as, as being a kind of a hindrance to meditative uh, development. For example, if we look at the writings of a man named uh, Yuan, Yuan Wu Kuqian, he, he was the author, the compiler of one of the largest collections of these, of these gongan, the so-called Blue Cliff Records, the, 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 the Bian, Bian Lu. And he was an important, I think, transitional figure in the uh, transformation of a literary study of Gongan into a contemplative exercise instead in full-blown Kanwa Chan. But he's still there in, in, in his Bian Lu. He treats the sensation of doubt as something which is harmful or obstructive to faith, which should be diligently avoided at all times, especially in the course of investigating or examining these, these traditional Chan cases. He talks about cutting through the sensation of doubt with an adamantine sword, a, a sword as sharp as diamond would be. And this explains that doubt has to be vanquished because it's an obstacle to faith and ultimately then to understanding. But it's his disciple, uh, uh, Dawei da Zonggao, who uh, turns uh, his teacher Yuan Wu's views about doubt on its head. And uh, uh, Dahwe is the one who reconceives doubt as a principal force that drives practice forward toward enlightenment. To the point that he actually, uh, according to the tradition, he actually burns the xylographs, the woodblocks of his teacher's major work, the, the, the Bian Lu, he burns them because he says they're filled with, filled with heresies are not being used correctly. Uh, the text still circulates. There, there were, there were uh, printed versions available from which the text was reconstructed. Uh, and it may be just a good story, but it's a good story nonetheless, I think, anyway. Um, but I think we have a very interesting description about this notion of doubt in another disciple of, of Da Hui's, a man named, named Gao Feng Yuan Miao during the, during the uh, Yuan dynasty in China, uh, who I think offers one of the most systematic and at times even eloquent presentations about the role of doubt in mature Kanwa Chan meditation that we find anywhere in Chan, Sun, or Zen literature. This is in a text called The Essentials of Chan, the, the, the so-called Chan, Chan, Chan Yao, or, or Sun Yo, which uh, is picked up in Korea as uh, one of the four books of the so-called uh, uh, Sa, Sa Jip collection, the fourfold collection, kind of a Buddhist analog of the, of the four books of the Confucian tradition. And uh, this is one of the, uh, the f one of the four books that are used in the uh, Chosun Dynasty um, uh, monastic seminaries to teach monks about the Kanwa tradition. And in this text, we find some uh, very perspicacious explorations about what the notion of doubt actually is. This uh, text gets picked up and used and excerpted quite extensively during the Chosun Dynasty, also by a teacher named Susan Hyu Hyu Jang, uh, the great Susan Tesa in Korea, who writes um, a collection called the Mirror on the Sun School, the Sun Sangha Gugam, Sangha Gugam, 
And this becomes one of the major primers for teaching Buddhism more broadly in Korea. That text gets transmitted to Japan uh, and, is, and finds its way into Japanese Rinzai accounts of Kanwa Chan practice. And so this description we find in, in uh, Yuan, uh, Yuan Miao's Essentials of Chan uh, finds its way all the way across the entirety of the East Asian Zen tradition. He tries to systematize uh, Kanwa Chan practice into what he calls the three essentials. These are its three principal constituents. These, these he describes as the faculty of great faith, uh, great fury, and sometimes glossed in the literature as great passionate intent. But I think fury or ferocity is really more the idea here. And finally, and last, and most importantly, the great sensation of doubt. This uh, typology is going to be followed subsequently in all three Zen traditions of China, Korea, and Japan. Uh, he describes them um, um, quite eloquently, I think, but maybe rather enigmatically, maybe not, no, no more intelligible than the Gongan themselves actually are. But I think we can kind of tease this uh, apart a little bit and get some sense as to what actually happens in Kanwa Chan practice. Let me just give you uh, just a brief um, uh, translation of this, this one section of his text. He says, if you're speaking about authentic sun contemplation, there have to be these three essentials. The first essential is to have the faculty of great faith. This matter, meaning Zen, of uh, enlightenment, should be so patently obvious that it's just as if you're leaning against Mount Sumeru. So, second essential, you have to have great fury which is just as if you've come across the villain who's murdered your father, and right then and there you want to cut him in half with a single strike of your sword. Okay. Uh, third essential is to have the sensation of great doubt, which is just as if you've done a heinous act in secret and are about to be exposed. Doesn't sound very meditative, you know, when you first, first look at this, this passage as well. But I think there are some very interesting hints here about what actually happens during uh, during uh, Kanwa Chan meditation. We saw before, we, we talked about Indian Buddhism. Uh, 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 faith there was seen to be as kind of a precursor to insight. You, you sort of tacitly accepted different beliefs, tenets, doctrines, test them, see if they held up or not. If you did, you could then believe them. You were, you, they were tested and would lead them to direct insight instead. Faith, when we look in the Zen tradition, though, is conceived rather differently. The, the issue is that we have in, Zen, in the Zen tradition, and really in Sinaitic Buddhism more broadly, all the way across China, Korea, and Japan, this claim that enlightenment is something which is imminent in the minds of all sentient beings, all people. Uh, this is expressed in this notion of numinous awareness, or elsewhere as Buddha nature. In Kanwa Chan, ultimately, the teachers will tell us, is all that is needed to be done in order to achieve enlightenment is simply to accept that fact. If enlightenment is something which is innate, there really isn't anything we have to do to become enlightened. We simply have to stop doing. We have to stop believing we're deluded and have faith in the fact that we are, in fact, and have always been enlightened Buddhas. We let go of this mistaken belief, and that in, that, that, that in itself, in letting go, is enough to become enlightened. Faith was the catalyst for this change of heart. This is change of heart is some, something like the bodhicitta, the, the bodhicitta pot, the arousing of the thought of enlightenment. And it was seen as a beneficial influence that's constantly emanating from this enlightened nature that's prompting all beings towards enlightenment. So the confidence that would be generated by this kind of great faith would make it seem just as if you're leaning against Mount Sumeru. Which, this is the axis mundi of the world itself in, uh, in Indian Buddhist cosmology. So once a person's faith were sufficient, the student would immediately acquiesce, just accept this original state of mind and would recognize his or her innate enlightenment. So faith was upgraded in Zen Buddhism from a necessary but still a subsidiary component of practice to what really becomes kind of the principal catalyst of awakening. But I think what's quite interesting is that Kanma Chan and Zen tradition generally also takes a rather more realistic view of the human condition. People may, in fact, be enlightened, but they've had years and decades, in my case, or the Buddhists would say lifetimes, in, in Buddhist view, to convince themselves not that they're enlightened, but that they're actually deluded. So therefore, it was perfectly natural to expect that even the most sincere of adepts would have doubts concerning this reality, this truth of one's innate enlightenment. 
about one's capacity to re rediscover that truth and about the ability of one's teacher to guide one toward that rediscovery. You're going to have doubts in religious practice. It's inevitable. So in a striking accommodation to the frailties of human nature, rather than making the perfection of faith alone the prerequisite to enlightenment, what Kanwa Chan does is develop an approach to practice that draws on these very doubts that are always going to be present in religious adherence and tries to make them a useful tool in practice instead. So what Kanwa Chan does is to um, uh, create a natural tension between faith, the faith in the fact that I'm an enlightened Buddha inherently, uh, the promise that I'm innately enlightened, and doubt, the reality that I'm a deluded, benighted, ordinary human being. And this contrast is what is then driving, uh, catalyzing the experience of then awakening. These factors, the Zen Buddhists say, are in symbiotic relationships, so that the more faith you have, the more doubt you will also have. And faith then is viewed as the essence of doubt. Doubt is the, uh, uh, is the function that leads then to awakening. Um, and this is drawing in a rubric that goes back to the awakening of faith, one of uh, important Chinese um, apocryphal compositions that was extremely influential more broadly in the evolution of Zen ideology and practice. So we have in the Kanwa Chan tradition doubt arising from the very deepest recesses of one's faith. This tension creates this almost an existential quandary that ultimately leads to the experience of awakening. These three factors, faith, doubt, awakening, are inextricably interconnected so that when faith is 100%, so too will be doubt. When doubt is 100%, so too will be awakening. So the more faith we have in the reality, the truth of our inherent Buddhahood, the more doubt we're going to have when we're unable to manifest that Buddhahood in all our activities. The more doubt we have, the more inquiry, the more, the more questioning we're able to generate, the more prospect there will be for a breakthrough that leads to awakening then instead. So when faith is 100%, so too will be doubt. When doubt is 100%, so too will be awakening. We even have in, uh, in, uh, in Gaofeng Yuan Mao himself, uh, one of the rare first-person accounts of how this sensation of doubt drives inquiry. Um, he says, unexpectedly in my sleep, I began to doubt the Huado, the, the, the thousand dharmas returned to one, to what does the one return? This is, again, another one of these, these gongan exchanges used here as a topic of inquiry, uh, where a monk comes to, to, to Zhao Zhao, the same man who said dogs don't have Buddha nature when they do. A um, monk asked him, um, uh, what's the meaning of bodhidharmas coming from the West? This typical tag question. Uh, Zhao Zhou answers, uh, when I was in Qingzhou, I, w I, I made a shirt that, that weighed seven jin, very heavy cloth shirt. Okay, what does it have to do with why did bodhidharma come from the West? So he's working on this question. He said, at that point, the sensation of doubt suddenly erupted. I stopped sleeping and forgot about eating. From dawn till dusk, from dusk till dawn, my mind was lucid and profound, lofty and imposing, pristine and flawless. One thought seemed to last for 10,000 years. The sense realms were tranquil and all persons were forgotten. It was as if I was stupid or senseless. The existential doubt that's created by investigating a question like this becomes the locus around which all the other doubts we experience in life coalesce. This overwhelming sense of doubt or inquiry or questioning then creates this intense pressure on the meditator's intellectual processes. And eventually this challenges your own sense of self-identity and self-worth. The coalescence of all of your thoughts and actions as he describes here around this question, this doubt, the sensation of doubt that arises with, with, uh, by, by, by examining one of these questions, produces the courage that one needs to abandon oneself seemingly to ultimate disaster, your own personal destruction. This is what the Buddhists mean when they talk about non-self. This is a Zen way of talking about this, this uh, idea of uh, anatman or non-self in Buddhism. This courage is what Yuan Miao means by the second of his three essentials, this great fury or great ferocity. This ferocity creates a strong urgency about practice, urgency that's so intense, it's just as if you've come across a villain who murdered your father and you want to slice him in half with a single strike of your sword then. <laughs> 
So this passion sustains the students through all these existential crises that are created by doubt. The fury has this sustaining power so that the doubt will not dissipate but becomes increasingly intense. And just as a filial son would want to avenge his father's death without concern for his own life, so too the meditator would continue to investigate this question, this huafadu, until he no longer could resist the mental pressure created by the doubt. We have a Korean teacher um, during the um, uh, late Koryori Chosun period named Taegu Pou. He's a successor in the Imji, Imje school, whom the later tradition regards as the progenitor of the contemporary Choge lineage of, of Korean Buddhism. But he correlates uh, this um, notion of Kanwa Chan, uh, Kanwa San, with this void and quiescent numinous awareness, the, the numinous awareness I talked about before, that was a source of sentience in all sentient beings. And he writes to one of his lay students at one point, he says, when you're investigating the Hwadu, uh, and the, the Hwadu becomes pristine, production and cessation then come to an end. Uh, this is uh, called quiescence. Um, a Hwadu that is unobscured, or not dark, uh, bu bu bume, uh, amid this quiescence is called numinous awareness. So this sense of doubt actually leads directly back by tracing back the radiance to this, to this quality of numinous awareness, which is the sentience in the mind. If you work in this manner, but then before long you will succeed. Your body and mind and the Hwadu will fuse into a singularity. So body and mind come together with the doubt generated by the Hwadu, fuse into a singularity, so there's nothing you can rely on and nowhere for your mind to go. At that point of singularity, the doubt becomes so intense that you can't hold it together anymore. And the doubt explodes, annihilating the student's identification with body and mind. The bifurcating tendencies of thought are brought to an end, and the limiting point of view that is the self is eliminated. Another way of talking about non-self in Buddhism is that you remove point of view, or you're looking from a point of view that has no fixed locus anymore. The awareness um, no longer sees distinctions between others and oneself. Consciousness expands infinitely, encompassing the entire universe, both spatially and temporally. These are, this is a direct quote from an earlier Zen teacher. This is what we mean by enlightenment in the Kanwachan tradition. And so what awakening does, it resolves this, this question uh, that you arouse regarding one of these topics of meditation. Uh, it's resolving this one doubt. So whether it's a thousand doubts or a myriad doubts, they're all just this one doubt. One who resolves this doubt will doubt nothing more, and at that point you become equivalent to the sages and saints of all of Buddhism. Shakyamuni, Maitreya, Vimalakirti, Elder, Pang. Um, so, thousand doubts, myriad doubts, is referring to the, all the doubts and anxieties that occur in daily life. All of these can be put to use uh, can coalesce around this one great doubt on the gongan, so that one is able to then achieve enlightenment. So despite how intractable these sayings and stories, these cases of the past Zen masters might seem, when you deploy them in the contemplation technique of kanwasan, we see how they can be used as, as tools for meditation practice. I think it's also intriguing, we look at the, at the authors who developed the Kanwa Chan tradition, Da Hui himself, Tego Pu, whom I just quoted before. Very often their, their discussions about Kanwa Chan are to lay people. They're in letters that are written to lay people. And it seems it's, it's almost as if um, these masters are specifically developing this technique to appeal to the needs of, of um, those of us who maintain who try to maintain religious cultivation in the context of the distracting secular world instead. Um, Kanwachan, Kanwasan is trying to foster uh, mental stress, uh, emotional anxiety, existential quandary. All these states are suggested in descriptions about the sensation of doubt as being like you've done this heinous act in secret and are about to be exposed. If you had done something really bad that, that people are going to find out about, you're going to feel a lot of stress. You're going to feel a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry. All these things can be put to the use uh, in the context of Kanwachan practice. And so I think it perhaps is no surprise that when we look at, um, at Kanwachan, it seems often to be directed at the laity as being the ideal audience for the, this kind of an approach. The emphasis on doubt encourages the students to foster 
and encourage and allow, actually, all the confusion and perplexity that you can muster. Every time you feel anxious or, or confused, all that can be part and parcel of Kanwachan practice. And so, for this reason, I think secular life in some ways was viewed as the ideal training ground for religious practice because it provided no lack of situations in which frustration, questionings, insecurity, anxieties would appear. All these are weapons in the arsenal of Kanwachan meditation. And moreover, the kind of obstacles that faced the householder were so ubiquitous and seductive, whether it's sex or wealth or fame and so forth ad infinitum, a person who was able to withstand them would develop tremendous dynamism, you know, Li, power, actually, that was claimed to be superior to that of the sequestered monks. This kind of dynamism would shake students loose from their attachments uh, and the things with which they identified, their spouses, their families, their houses, their professions, whatever it might be, and thus help to consummate this kind of radical non-attachment that was the goal of all the Buddhist practice. But I think actually it's the peculiarly East Asian Zen notion of what doubt can be and the role it can play in practice that is so radically different from Indian Buddhist notions of this term that can be said to play the pivotal role in what translates uh, a meditator from a deluded, unenlightened, benighted, ordinary person into an enlightened sage then. That's the crucial crux of the problem. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Kapkel, for this uh, intriguing uh, <laughs> My pleasure. presentations on the doubt, faith, and enlightenment. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the, yeah, we have a small, <laughs> small uh, gift. Oh, oh, oh thank you. Well, That's very and kind of you all. Uh, oh, thank you. I, I could water and gifts both. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much.